So Kill Sort is a spike sorter that um, I started building when I was in Mateo and Kenneth's lab uh, as a postdoc six, seven years ago. Um, it's a um, spike sorter for large scale electrophysiology. It was developed uh, primarily on NeuroPixels data um, and it has evolved over the years. And today I'm going to uh, try to, well, first I'm going to describe this evolution to you so you can kind of see it here. It starts in Kilosort 1 with kind of a few features, you know, maybe not important right now to focus what exactly all these steps are. We're going to get into that. Um, the Kilosort 2 was the first framework that had tracking and allowed us to deal with drift. Drift will be an important topic to talk about today. Kilosort 2.5 and another way to deal with drift. Um, that's also something we're going to talk about today. Kilosort 3 introduced some new clustering algorithms over here, this thing called the recursive pursuit. We're not going to talk about that today because it was actually made obsolete by a new um, clustering algorithm that we introduced in Kilosort 4 called graph clustering. Now, if you follow kind of this progression here, what you'll be seeing is that there's some features that have been there from the beginning, some steps of the pipeline that have proven absolutely crucial and have kind of stayed. Uh, and then there's some things we've been messing with, uh, hoping to kind of improve and, and get to the same kind of, uh, of stability. And we're going to start with drift correction today. It's, you know, we're going to skip filtering and whitening. You guys have already heard about that. Um, drift correction, I would say, is maybe the single most important thing you can change in your spike sorting and even um, actual experimental setup uh, that you can you can improve it as the single most important thing you can do to kind of improve the quality of your recordings. So we'll we'll see why that is. And after that, I'm going to talk to you about this thing called template deconvolution, which is essentially how we find spikes and how we find especially overlapping spikes that might have what's known as spike collisions between them. And then finally, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about uh, these new fancy clustering algorithms that um, we've introduced recently. So starting getting straight into the problem of drift correction. Um, now you've noticed you know, neural pixels. So if we're gonna do some kind of motion correction, is this gonna be very similar to image registration? Of course, image registration has a long history of, of being used and developed and improved uh, to achieve stability for microscopy. Here's a calcium imaging recording where it's absolutely crucial to be able to do anything with this data. Uh, you can see a, a live animal is just, the brain is always jiggling and moving around. And after registration, everything is nice and stable. Now, we can't straightforwardly adapt this um, image registration to neural pixels data for a few reasons, uh, a few obstacles we have to overcome. So the first one is uh, pixel densities. Uh, obviously, there's neural pixels has a lot of electrodes, but it still pales in comparison to the number of actual pixels that are in a calcium imaging recording or any image really. The second problem is that um, there are, it's hard to figure out what features to track. Uh, it's kind of easy when you have a, an image of cells or something, you can track edges of the cells and other little features that are kind of stably present in most images. Um, whereas for electrophysiology, features are actually quite transient. They're just these short spikes that give us all the information about which neuron they belong to. Um, and that neuron ought to be stable. And finally, um, with NeuroPixels 1.0 especially, but also other probe geometries, we have this other problem that the geometry is staggered as opposed to uniform. Um, and that also introduces other, uh, other things to worry about when doing the data interpolation. So we wanted to overcome all these obstacles. Um, now, I should say right away that as as usual, if you have a problem and you can solve that problem in um, the actual experiment, then you should, rather than trying to solve it with software. 
and in fact, this issue of, of staggered probe geometry was actually kind of solved in NeuroPixels 2, um, because as you will learn in the next talk, um, the geometry is now aligned. So we no longer have this, uh, this problem of a kind of fractional positions uh, for the channels. Now, um, sure, you know, spikes from neuropixels do look great. They're kind of aligned vertically like this. You can see the same spike on many channels, right? You don't have this kind of NYQist-like problem of subsampling uh, your spikes. Um, and I would say if your problem, you realize you have a big problem with drift, uh, maybe the easiest thing, if you can get your hands on them, it would be to get these neuropixels 2 probes. But if your problem is within the range of drift situations we're aware of, at least, um, then you ought to be able to solve it with, with Kilosort. Uh, and here's how we solve it. So the issues we, we had to kind of figure out was what, what exactly we're going to track to be able to, to tell drift apart. And this is what's known as a drift map. Uh, every single dot here is a spike from an entire recording of about an hour. And what you can see is that um, spikes that have higher amplitudes have darker colors, they're more black. Uh, and they're plotted at the white position in which they've been detected. So we have this kind of spike detection framework to be able to detect a lot of these spikes efficiently. And once we do, we can make a plot like this. Uh, and as we look as a function of time here on the x-axis, our eyes already can pick up uh, on all of these periods where um, uh, it appears like these bands are kind of moving up and down, right? Now, for this particular recording, this central part is where uh, Nick Steinmetz, who actually developed one of the original prototypes for this, uh, but also did the recordings where he moved with a manipulator, he moved the electrodes up and down to give us kind of some kind of ground truth drift to find. You can see there's also drift before he moved the electrode up here. Um, it, right, and I, I'm not gonna go into the details of how we quantify this. I would say, as usual, if your eye can pick up a pattern, in this case, drift in, in an image, then modern machine learning algorithms ought to be able to pick up that pattern too. The details, you can read about them in the paper, but you know, assuming that you, you trust me, we're doing this thing um, well, then you can see what you end up with, and it's plotted in, in kilosort as well, uh, is an estimate of the Y shift um, of the probe in microns. You can see this region where Nick moved the data with the manipulator. Uh, we kind of recovered this sinusoidal, uh, and we also recover some smaller amounts of drift before and after. Now, once we know what the drift is, we need to use it to correct the data with it. Um, and that's kind of a second hard part here. Um, and it's a little hard because all of the methods for interpolation, right? So if we want to shift the data up and down by some fractional amounts, uh, we're going to need interpolation. Um, and all the standard kinds of interpolation kind of assume that you have a a reasonable region of, of, of pixels or um, detectors where you are sampling your signal. Uh, and then it can use linear or cubic or bicubic interpolation to um, upsample that signal. Now, bicubic is probably the kind of thing that we want because it kind of has these nice smoothness properties. Um, the problem with it again is that um, if our geometry is staggered, um, or you know, not as nice as an image, uh, then we're going to have problems with um, with this kind of framework. Well, you can't really apply it if your geometry is staggered, or you have to write it yourself. Um, but if we're going to write it ourselves, then actually we can do something a little more general, which is going to apply for every geometry, uh, which is to use this method known as Kriging interpolation. For those of you who have heard of Gaussian processes, it's very similar concept, uh, kind of a non-probabilistic version of Gaussian processes uh, called Kriegian interpolation. The goal is if we have the signal at the blue channels, we want to know the signal at the orange channel. 
that is our goal because presumably we'll be kind of the probe has moved and we want to kind of recover um, recover what the real value of the voltage is at the orange channel. So in creating interpolation, what we do is we make an assumption first that the, sorry, that the covariance pattern of these channels in space um, is well described by some kind of Gaussian that decays with some, um, some sigma here. Um, choose sigma to be like a reasonable value, like 10 or 20 microns. Um, and then we've got ourselves our kernel for our creating interpolation. And if we assume that kernel, then there's kind of nice, simple equations you can get right off of Wikipedia that are going to tell you exactly how to predict this orange channel. In this case, would be B in the equation. How you predict that given all the blue channels, which would be A. And it gives us here a Gaussian, and we just care about the mean of this Gaussian. Um, and if we just compute this mean, it gives us a prediction for what the orange channel should be. And that prediction is going to be nice and smooth because we assume smoothness uh, in the process of making this prediction. All right, and we do that for every channel to kind of figure out how much, uh, well, what the probe, what the electrical field should look like if the probe were to be shifted down by, you know, 15 microns in this case. Okay, so with those two steps, drift estimation and kind of reinterpolation to correct for drift, um, we can go back to our original data and we can look at what the same drift map looks like when we run it a second time, but now we apply it to the uh, registered um, data set. And you can see that some of the biggest patterns have gone away, right? I'm gonna go back and forth give you a chance to, to see that the big patterns disappear. There's a few little things left here and there. Let's see, up up here, you can see maybe there, there's a, a little bit of, of uh, motion left. And why would that be? Um, well, probably because the um, probe does, well, the tissue around the probe uh, does not move in a rigid way. And so we can do a little extension of the algorithm uh, to make it non-rigid, uh, pretty straightforward. We split up the probes into multiple parts. We estimate drift on each part, and then we figure out a way to nicely stitch those parts back together in a smooth fashion. When we do that, we end up with multiple traces now for drift. I can see them here in different colors. Um, they're mostly doing the same things, but you can see sometimes, such as in this period, uh, they're actually doing slightly different things across depths. All right, and here's the manipulator period again. Um, and if we look now at the non-rigid registration, we can see that a lot of those smaller drifts have also gone away, uh, basically because the top of the probe um, was moving independently. Well, not independently, but a little independently of, of the bottom. And again, not the probe, but the tissue. Go back and forth. Look at this fix. It right, looks good. All right. This isn't just a problem for, um, you know, head fix neuropixels. Here it is in a freely moving uh, rat. Uh, this is data from Rich Gardner in the Moser lab. Uh, and you can see even there that as a function of a, actually a much longer period of time here, something like six hours, um, you can see there's still quite a lot of drift. And it also changes across channels. So even in the freely moving case, uh, where you think, you know, you would hope that your electrodes have kind of stabilized uh, in place after several days, uh, there is still drift. And maybe that shouldn't be surprising because it's just brain is jiggly, right? It's, it's suspended and fluid. Um, yeah, even during sleep, there's drift. Um, even during rest, there's drift. Uh, and of course, maybe faster drift during running and in the open field arena. Now, the original algorithm for drift correction came out together with the NeuroPixels 2.0 paper. Uh, you can find all its details actually in the supplementary information of that paper. Uh, we had some benchmarks there, based, basically based on on uh, on Nick's um, uh, on on Nick's experiments where he moved the electrodes up and down. 
Um, and in those particular cases, what we benchmarked was whether the units output by kilosort were correlated with the motion that Nick induced. Of course, there should be no reason physiologically for that to happen. So if they are correlated, it's probably just because the drift is introducing uh, this correlation in an artifactual way. The spike sorting isn't able to, to track neurons over um, all depths of the drift. And you can see that is the case to, uh, to some extent uh, before the stabilization or motion correction, uh, but it mostly goes away after the motion correction. And if you look at how many units are kind of stably sorted, how many unstable units there are, uh, you can see all the numbers are you know, going in the right direction if you do the drift correction. Now, um, okay, how do I see that bottom part? Okay, so we need better benchmarks. Um, we thought because this is you know benchmarking drift correction in a very specific case where Nick moved the electrode with some pre-specified statistics of drift. Uh, and really we didn't have ground truth here. We didn't know uh, what are the actual units doing. And so making better ground truth has been kind of a, a big problem um, in, in the field as a whole. It's been hard to make progress without good ground truth and it's very hard to get good ground truth. But we thought we had an idea. And so here's um, what we did. We were lucky that the International Brain Laboratory, which is this consortium of many, many labs, uh, were doing these many neuropixels recordings uh, that they freely shared online, uh, including the raw data. And if we look across these recordings, you see there's a large number of possible ways that drift could, could be. We categorize them in kind of these five big categories. There's probably other categories too, but some simple ones to think about, no, no drift, medium drift, kind of in the middle of the distribution, higher drift that goes to bigger values like plus minus 40 microns. Uh, fast drift, here it's uh, the x-axis is actually zoomed in. And this is drift where um, the probe can move quickly on fast time scales. That could be a problem, let's say, for our algorithm because it assumes uh, a certain minimal uh, batch size in time. And if the probe is moving during that period uh, and everything is corrected the same way, then it's not really correcting drift. Uh, and then there's other things like step drift where the probe can move all of a sudden um, for whatever reason during the experiment, most likely some kind of major bump or major um, struggle of the animal or, or just something that moves the probe by uh, a large amount. And of course, in practice, there's combinations of all of these. Um, and we have to ensure that the algorithms can be robust to uh, all these different possibilities. So to create a better benchmark, um, we made these simulations that have drift. And uh, actually, I worked on this closely with Carson. Um, who has joined at, at, at this stage in the project to kind of help us do this well and, and create all these simulations. And what we did is we looked at the distribution of drift across IBL recordings. You can see here on the log axis, on average it's about 10 microns, but there's some recordings here at the long end that have a lot more drift. And if you look at one of those recordings up here, you can see the drift is spanning quite a big range um, of depth. And our idea was if we have these recordings where the probe is moving, you know, we have a continuous sampling of depths from one of these recordings, uh, we can in fact kind of extract units, you know, carefully extract units um, that can be seen at different depths along this drift. If we can see them at different depths, then we can kind of put together those pictures and create a kind of a denser electric field of this neuron uh, that is actually sample, you know, subsampled below the sampling grid that the, the Neuropixels 1 probe has. And we're able to do this for I don't know, several hundred, almost a thousand, maybe 500 units or so. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that um, this already kind of point out something that's going to happen after our drift correction, 
if we take one of these units, for example, and you can see this one's a little smaller on channels, it's kind of just big on this middle channel here, smaller on other channels. We're not going to be able to perfectly uh, interpolate and correct this waveform with the strategy I told you before. In fact, after drift correction, you can see there are still differences um, between this waveform when it's coming from minus 20 microns, there'll be the purple trace versus when it's coming from 20 microns, there'll be the yellow trace. Uh, and that's simply because we're sampling below this, you know, NYQS frequency, below the, um, the smoothness of the actual trace. And so we're going to need other steps in the algorithms to step in and kind of deal with that. Uh, and I'm going to get to clustering and uh, soon and, and tell you how that works there. Now, the simulations we created had uh, superimposed these ground truth spikes as the probe is being shifted and moved up and down, uh, plus um, a background that's composed of two things. First, there's kind of simulated pink noise with the same spectrum as some real recordings, uh, as well as some uh, multi-unit activity, which is basically waveforms, but that have been scaled down so much that they can't be picked up as single units anymore. Uh, they just form a, a realistic background. All right, so simulation looks good. At the top is simulation, the bottom is a real recording. Good enough, I mean, sure, I'm sure we can find differences. And if we look at drift maps from um, NeuroPixels uh, 2, on the left, or maybe one, I'm not sure, uh, from the NeuroPixels 2 paper, and we compare them to our drift maps that we get from uh, our simulations. Uh, in both cases, you can kind of track the drift by eye in, in the same kind of way. The first thing we can ask is, is KiloSort able to estimate drift well? Um, the answer is yes. Here's a medium drift simulation. Uh, the dotted superimposed lines are estimated versus ground truth. You can see they're right on top of each other, very correlated. Similarly, in the high drift scenario, they're very correlated. This may be like small offsets vertically, but those are not large. In contrast, in a situation like this, where I told you drift is fast, uh, actually then, you know, they're correlated, but they're, it's not all that great. Uh, and that's simply because Within the same batch, there can be fast drift, followed by you know kind of stably sitting at at zero microns or something like that. And these will be cases where we're going to want to look to a clustering algorithm to step in um, and kind of pick up the slack there and, and fix that problem. Uh, to benchmark, we actually were able to run a whole lot of algorithms. Uh, most of the ones we thought people might be using today, this was only possible because. Uh, Alessio very nicely uh, and his co-authors developed the spike interface um, uh, API basically that allows us to very easily run uh, different algorithms together. First thing you can see as far as runtime goes, uh, there's all these algorithms here at the, you know, kind of below 30, around 30 minutes, uh, but even the ones that run for 70, 80 minutes, that's still very much um, an okay for one neuropixels probe. If we look at our medium drift simulation, um, I'm going to show you a bunch of plots like this where um, we looked at the 600 ground truth units that we put in, and we looked at the score, uh, the best matching score to a unit output by one of these algorithms. And for each algorithm, we sorted their scores, so they're kind of easier to see. So for example, you can look at kilosort 4 and you can say above this 0.8 kind of threshold of, let's say, goodness, a unit is, is well matched if it's at, matched at 0.8. Um, you can see we've got something like 550 units found in that way. Whereas for you know, other algorithms, this uh, the place they cross this line is, is further and further down. Uh, if we look at high drift scenario, um, all of the curves are a little bit to the left, uh, but still kind of the same ordering between algorithms applies. Now, if we look at this fast drift scenario, where I was telling you that drift correction isn't really going to be uh, working so well, um, turns out we can still do pretty well, 
even when there's some amount of drift left. We can summarize these with the number of units that actually uh, exceed that matching score of 0 0.8. Here's for the, the three kinds of drifts we talked about so far. Uh, again, you can see kill sort four here has the, the, the biggest number of units identified. Um, high drift is harder than fast drift and of course the medium drift uh, as you'd expect. Now we can go to this significantly harder case of having this big step drift. Uh, and it's harder because you can't simply have a continuous distribution of features uh, interpolating between for your clustering algorithm to pick up on. Um, and indeed, that kind of reduces the performance even of kilo sort four, but you can see for the other algorithms, it, it, it's really a drastic reduction in performance. And, and this is where, as I was telling you, the you know a hardware solution is preferable to a software solution because if you have aligned sites, um, actually, this step drift is a lot less uh, problematic. Uh, we recover kind of the same kind of high number of uh, match ground truth units in kilosort 4. Now, that's all nice and good for cases when there's drift. What if there's no drift? Um, and you can see when there's no drift, kilosort 4 also does very well. Also the other kilosorts. Uh, but actually, even in those cases, we outperform all these other pipelines. So you might wonder what's kind of happening there. And what's happening there is um, something that has been reported before. Um, if we look at which units Kilosort does better on, uh, we can see actually here as a function of amplitude, uh, it's really at these low amplitudes, right? Where this black curve and the blue curve are doing really well, maybe at high amplitude, you know, compared to the other frameworks. Uh, at high amplitudes, that's much less the case. A lot of algorithms can do pretty well up here, uh, but it's really at the low amplitudes. And um, right, we're going to maybe get into the reason for that a little bit when we talk about uh, the actual spike detection framework, because you might imagine this is a matter of being able to detect these spikes at low amplitudes. Now, is this relevant to real data? And I can't really answer that question directly uh, because really the only way to answer it for you to go and try it on your data and see how uh, well it performs, for example, in comparison to other algorithms. Um, what I can do is I can make simulations that are a little bit more realistic. Uh, and we ran these, performed these hybrid ground truth simulations. We did them in the no drift scenario because that's kind of the only way we could do it. Um, and for that, we took recordings now that had almost no drift from the low end of the IBL recordings. Here's three example ones uh, from different labs and different brain areas. And what we did is we used those as background to generate a more realistic background for a simulation. Um, and then we just added some ground truth spikes with no drift uh, on top of this background. So now this should be a little more realistic. Um, we can look at the performance of the algorithms and now the maximum is 300, you know, pretty much similar uh, kinds of fractions of units identified, I guess I should say first, right? 250 out of 300 um, and uh, also kind of similar ordering of the algorithms. So even in the no drift scenario, uh, Kilosort has this ability to find spikes at the kind of low amplitude range. Um, why might that be? Well, let's see. Well, before we get there, there's this analysis of false positives that I'm going to just kind of skip really. Um, and it's, it's a very simple conclusion. The false positives are similar between, um, between algorithms. But really, I wanted to get a, you know, why, um, all right, there we go. Um, why are we able to find spikes at this low end of the of the spectrum? Uh, and that has to do with these two other big steps in, in, in kilosorts. So we've discussed drift correction. Now we want to talk a little bit about template deconvolution. You can see this has been around in some form for a while. Uh, I'm going to just show you the latest version of this. 
And this is the pipeline that detects spikes and extracts their features. And it works as a sequence of these kind of incrementally better ways of detecting spikes. We detect spikes first with simple templates, and then we use those kind of simple features uh, to get a set of learned templates that are now going to be much more adapted to the actual data set and able to um, find spikes at, at that low end of the amplitude range. Let's go through this one step at a time. Here's some pre-processed data. Uh, in the inset, you can see kind of some overlap of spikes. Um, this is the problem people talk about when they talk about spike collisions. Um, and uh, it's because different neurons fire at kind of similar times on similar channels. And in this case, it's even hard to tell without a model how many spikes there are in here. I'm going to say probably still just two, but you know, who knows? Let's see what KiloSword finds. Um, and the first part of this is to try to get some kind of detection going by just using some simple templates. So you could have done this with threshold crossings. That would be kind of the classical way, but that's not really going to find you, let's say, spikes that, um, for example, they have small amplitude on their biggest channel, but they have kind of very consistent pattern in space. Uh, so they have a bigger spatial footprint. And so to be able to capture spikes of different spatial footprints with different kind of durations of the spike, um, we kind of built this set of simple templates. Um, the actual temporal parts of the waveforms are detected from the real data to kind of have some way of adapting to the time scales of the spikes in the data. Um, and then we take the set of spike that we, spikes we've detected uh, and we use it to do a little bit of clustering. Now, these aren't gonna be like a great set of spikes, right? We, we just detected them with these simple templates. There's gonna be things missing and kind of, uh, there's no kind of overlap detection or resolution, for example, but it's good enough for us to do some clustering and get a set of better adapted templates, right? Things that look more like the exact neurons we find in the recording. And now with these learned templates, we can go back to our data. Um, and what we do is we kind of sweep the templates, right? This is the deconvolution operation. We sweep templates over the data in time um, and look at places where the dot product of the template with the data is pretty high. And for places where the dot product is high, we figure out exactly by how much to scale that template to best explain that position. Um, and we subtract it off from the data. And if we can subtract it off in a, in a good way, then we can come back with a second template around there uh, and detect other spikes that might still be in that region, um, essentially resolving the, the spike collision problem. Now, the reason why all of this works is that we have an actual generative model of the data. It's a very simple generative model. It's just saying that the voltages at a certain channel at a certain time uh, are a superposition, a sum of basically templates of certain spikes. This is a cluster assignment at particular times TK, uh, modulated by some amplitudes plus noise. We know some things in here. We know the learned templates. We've learned those, so we know A. We know the data, that's V. What we don't know is sigma, the cluster assignment for each spike, the times of the spikes, TK, and the amplitude, X of K. And those are the things that the deconvolution process identifies when it sweeps the templates across the data to try to find big projections, XK, of that template um, at particular data locations. And if we have a good generative model, then we can use it to reconstruct the data. And we can kind of compare between what we see on the left, what we see on the right is the reconstruction. If there's things missing in the reconstruction, it means you know something didn't go quite well, right? If there's a missing spike that you think it should have been found and it's not found, 
then maybe there's kind of something wrong with the thresholds for your data. You need to adjust those um, or really just kind of think a little more deeply into why uh, it wouldn't have been found um, by Kilosort. The residual, as you can see, you know, should really just look kind of like white noise. Well, not white, pink, pink noise. All right, so now we have our spikes. We have um, these corrected features because we've, remember we subtracted off overlapping spikes so that one spike is not influenced by a background coming from the other spike. Um, in previous version of Kilosort, this would be it. These learned templates, right, in Kilosort 2, 2.5, 1, these learned templates were the actual units. The spike detections are the actual spikes. Um, and now you just go to Phi and you look at the uh, what you got and try to see if you're happy with it. Now, in Kilosort 4, also in Kilosort 3, um, we actually realize we can take these features that have now been corrected. They come from what we think is the majority of the spikes, and we can recluster them. And in the reclustering process, now we can use a much more fancy algorithm because we don't have to simultaneously go back to the data and extract spikes and worry about overlaps. No, all of that is, is gone. It's, it's behind us. We fixed that. We dealt with that problem. Now we can just take these corrected features um, and apply whatever um, uh, spike sorting, well, clustering algorithms we, we think might be best. So this is where the last part of my talk starts. Uh, looks like I have about 10 minutes um, before questions. Uh, enough to describe this clustering algorithm. Now, this is one of um, its so-called graph-based clustering algorithms, which start with uh, data points here and neighbor relationships between points. So for every point, we found its nearest neighbors. Every point is a spike. We find its nearest neighbors. And neighbor clustering is essentially an, opera an iterative operation where we've got some set of uh, clusters that we start with. We actually initialize it with a large set of clusters from um, k-means plus plus, uh, kind of a standard initialization method. Um, and then at every iteration, we go through each one of these spikes and we ask which of the clusters has more neighbors uh, to, to this spike. Uh, and I should assign this spike to the cluster that, where it has more neighbors. In this case, it'd be the blue cluster um, because we have you know, six neighbors there. And this continues iteratively. Every point gets reassigned on every iteration to all these clusters uh, until everything kind of stabilizes and, and falls into a, a stable equilibrium. Now, this isn't too different from some other uh, algorithms in this space, like the Leiden and Louvain algorithms. Those are very popular for things like uh, RNA-seq and, and clustering um, cell types. Now, for spike sorting, um, we actually had to go a little beyond those for a few reasons. One, we had to accelerate. We had to make it really fast on the GPU. I'm not going to talk about that. You can see it, you can see it in the paper. Um, but the other reason was that these kinds of algorithms also have um, some local minima problems. Uh, they're not just local minima, they're just um, basically they'll overcluster or undercluster certain clusters, but not others. Uh, and it's kind of hard to find a parameter where you get the clustering that you want. And so what we do in Kilosort is we we take this algorithm all the way to this stage where here's the Tisney, here's, you know, again, the spikes, each little cloud is a cloud of spikes. You can see some of the clouds have been split. So we need to fix that. We need to kind of merge them back together. Um, and that's where we thought a little bit of domain knowledge is going to be very useful because of course, these, these graph algorithms don't have, that they don't know about spike sorting. They, um, really are kind of general um, graph algorithms. So how do we inject a little bit of domain knowledge in there? Well, what we did is we constructed this, uh, what we call a merging tree. Not too different from other hierarchical trees you might've seen. 
uh, what happens is at the base here, the leaves are all these 27 clusters. And as you go up in some parameter, in this case, it's modularity, um, these leaves are going to start merging together at different levels uh, in this in this mm -hmm. emerging tree. And our job is to kind of start checking these merges, um, basically to to use our domain knowledge at these you know particular merging points to decide if that merge should be uh, actually performed or not. And we actually start from the top and we go down. And what might happen is um, we, you know, we reach one of these nodes and we look at our two clusters and we find the regression axis between these two clusters. So that's the axis that separates them the best. Uh, and we look at the, what the projection looks like. You can see here, these are like two very clearly distinct clusters. There's no continuity between them. The projection is very bimodal. So this is gonna be a no merge decision, right? So we're going to, uh, let the tree split these two clusters. Now here's one that's a much more clear merge where this projection is actually quite continuous and it's continuous. We know it can't be a single well-isolated unit. That's a merge. And here's one where it's actually a little more um, harder to figure out what it is because it does have some bimodality, but it doesn't go all the way down to zero. And so in cases like that, we also use different information, which is now coming from the auto and cross correlograms of the spikes in these clusters. And if we look at this particular case on the right, where we weren't sure, uh, you can see every little piece alone, the orange and the green, they both have kind of a good refractory period. Right? These are auto correlograms on the x-axis are time samples, y-axis are pairs of spikes. Uh, and there cannot be uh, pairs basically here at zero because neurons are refractory. So this is a refractory autocorrelogram. If we look at the cross correlogram, that's also refractory, uh, which of course suggests that these two are part of the same neuron because otherwise there's very little reason why two nearby neurons should have this very refractory interdiction zone uh, in their firing patterns. All right, so we use these criterion, criteria at the merging tree nodes to decide how far down we go down the merging tree. And you can see here, the things that have been kept the same color are the pieces that uh, were put together by this step of the algorithm. And here's what the new colors look like after merges. Now it looks reasonable to us in the T-SNE plot. Uh, and out of these, if we look at just the units that have a clean uh, autocorrelogram, clean refractory period, um, you can see just these big ones come out. Also some of the small clusters uh, and some of the stuff in the middle is, is anyway. Waveforms look good. If we look at the auto and the cross correlograms in the upper part of the plot here, you can see they're very flat in between units as you'd expect for different neurons. Uh, and you can see they have refractory periods um, on the autocorrelograms and the diagonal. In the bottom part of this plot are the regression axis projections. You can see they're all, they're all nice and bimodal, uh, very kind of clean separation uh, of these clusters. If we look at the clusters in context on the probe, we can make a picture like this, where every spike is plotted at its lateral and um, depth position, uh, and it can be colored in the color of its respective cluster. Here's the part of the probe where we zoomed in on. And I should say the clustering is done on these segments. You can control how big they are. Typically they're about 40 microns. Um, so pretty small segments where we might get something like 20, 30 clusters to deal with. Um, and then we, we do it in a kind of overlapping way across the entire probe. Um, and then we kind of stitch it all back together into one single clustering. All right, finally, we can um, use our um, benchmarks that I've shown you before to ask what parts of the pipeline matter the most. Um, 
don't have time to go into de too much detail here, but basically we kind of took off the steps that you might think you know are, uh, might be important. Uh, here's we talked about drift correction, we talked about template deconvolution, and we talked about this second clustering. And if we just look at those in the results, uh, I'm just gonna try to read the results for you. For drift correction, if we don't do drift correction, you can see a lot of red here and red is bad. So obviously, you know, for no drift, it doesn't matter. For medium drift, it matters very little actually, right? Because the clustering can pick up the slack and deal with it a bit. But as soon as we get into these kind of worse drift regimes, uh, things get really bad. So that's where you really need drift correction. Do you really need non-rigid drift correction? Apparently not, at least not in, in these data sets we simulated. Um, but we don't know if we simulated a, a good enough range of non-rigid drifts. Now this, again, very red. What is this? It's the template deconvolution part. Uh, so again, very important to do the um, collision resolution and be able to um, uh, detect spikes at those lower amplitudes. And finally, here's the kind of the second clustering I was telling you. It uses this meta information that comes from the uh, the cross correlograms and also the uh, the bimodality axis. You can see if we don't have that meta information, we again do really poorly. With that, I can conclude. Um, here's the GUI. Uh, uh, this is the Python version of the GUI. The initial one was made by Nick Steinmetz. Shashwat mostly just reproduced that in Python. And to summarize, uh, drift correction, as I've shown you, is important. Uh, it's I should also stress out that you know maybe the clustering algorithm uh, you know went over your head partly because I didn't describe it right. Um, you can look at the description in the paper. There's still you know thing it takes a while to really get that, but I think drift correction is not that difficult to like really understand deeply. And I stress this because um, I really do think it's the it's the single most important thing to fiddle with uh, to get your recordings uh, processed well, to understand what's happening in your data. Like you might not realize you have big drift because you know maybe you 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 skipped some step in your pipeline where you could have stabilized something more, for example. Um, and so just fixing that can really improve the quality of your recordings. Um, and of course, it's even better on NeuroPixels 2.0 that you're going to hear about next. This uh, template deconvolution, or you know, sometimes we've called it matching pursuit, or some people just call it template matching, although just the matching part isn't the whole story. We also need to do the subtraction. Uh, but this has been around for a while in the in the kilo short environment, uh, and it's worked really well to detect spikes, not just overlapping, but also at low amplitudes. Uh, finally, I should say, you know, after being able to deal with these kinds of, I would say, lower level problems, right? Um, in some sense, both of these are pre-processing steps for the actual clustering. So only then, you know, were we able to really use more fancy algorithms uh, to do a better job. Yeah. Um, yeah, and with that, I think, uh, I'm, yeah, Killser 4 is going to be released soon. Um, and I should also thank the people who helped me kind of bring the paper over the finish line, which you can uh, read on BioArchive right now. Uh, that'll be Carson Stringer uh, and, and Shashwat. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, Jacob Pennington as well. And thanks everyone for your time.